Um, if you look at the title of the lecture, um, I have made a slight change to it, um, a change though that I think is actually significant in terms of um, my priorities for this talk and for the larger project. The talk is now called Attack of the Putin-Loving SpongeBob Clones colon Vatnik on and off the Russian internet. Um, and the reason for the name change has to do with these um, larger issues that I've been gesturing towards. We've already talked about um, how Russian memes and viral video, viral content um, can be connected to constructions of Russianness internally and for external consumption, discussing um, Obama Chmo and its, uh, um, or its origins on um, bumper stickers and moving into the internet and onto t-shirts and back and forth. Um, Putin Huilo starting out as a soccer chant and moving onto the internet. The Gopnik starting out as a, a street phenomenon and becoming um, a, a worldwide meme. So I wanna continue, um, I wanna continue all this. I, I'm more and more committed to thinking about the way that internet memes um, and classical memes, that is the notion of memes in, um, invented by Richard Dawkins as units of information, regardless of their source and regardless of where they circulate. I wanna think a bit, I wanna always keep in mind how um, internet memes are interacting with the general culture, that is the memes of culture um, writ large, even when they're not on the internet. Um, and I think um, it's a good thing to bring up now because it's a big part of the Vatnik phenomenon. I'm also concerned about this because of um, where this all fits into my own, um, my own research. Um, so this talk um, is based on a few pages that have ended up in the first draft of uh, my book, Russia's Alien Nations, The Secret Identities of Post-Socialism, which is hopefully being read somewhere by some anonymous readers at Cornell. Um, and it, but it also should be part of this memes project because that the, the book that I've finished the draft of is about identity, but it's involving memes. So obviously this should get into the memes book as well. Um, and I need to figure out um, either how not to self plagiarize or how much to self plagiarize or whether or not it even matters. Um, but this publishing um, conundrum to me is also an intellectual question. To what extent can and should internet memes be studied as an isolated online phenomenon? Um, so in Russia's Alienations, I'm not studying it as an isolated um, online phenomenon. For the memes book, it suggests that I might need to. However, um, what this is all leading me to think as I, as I go through these examples that we've been talking about lecture after lecture is that um, to think of internet memes only in terms of their circulation on the internet, however um, paradoxical this may sound, is not doing justice really to what internet memes do um, as they circulate through the entire culture. Um, and Vatnik, um, as we're gonna see, will be a case study um, of why we need to think of the external non-internet world as well as the internet world. All right, so to talk about the Vatnik, um, we need to step back a bit um, because I consider Vatnik um, as a manifestation of a phenomenon I call Soviet self-hatred, um, which sounds pretty self-explanatory, right? It's this um, um, Soviet self-hatred is, is concentrating on the things um, about which a Soviet citizen or ex-Soviet citizen might feel shame or self-conscious about and then um, that can get crystallized into some sort of um, negative um, image or caricature. Um, and the most famous pr precursor, so Soviet self-hating precursor to the Vatnik is um, the Savok. Um, here's my um, example of a Savok. This is one of the characters from the film Aknov Paris, Window to Paris in the 1990s, where um, a bunch, one of the things that happens is a bunch of people, a bunch of sort of ordinary kind of actually yokel Russians, Savok Russians um, in a St. Petersburg um, communal uh, St. Petersburg apartment um, find a window in an apartment that allows them to end up in Paris. And once they're there, they start um, hawking all these horrible tchotchkes and souvenirs, and they actually take a Citroën um, automobile piece by piece through the window to bring it back to St. Petersburg. They're, they're deliberately embarrassing, but they're also kind of charming. Um, the term Savoy goes back to the 1980s, though there's lots of dispute over its origin, though thankfully this time no one is, is um, suggesting an acronym. It seems like every time there's a dispute over an origin of a term for these lectures, I mention some acronym. There's no acronym I know of here. Um, so people who either have claimed to author the term Savoy or have been identified as authors of Savoy are the rock musician um, Alexander Gradsky, the critics Violin Genius, and Mikhail Epstein. Um, but there's real lack of reliable attribution um, as to who really came up with the term, which I think is fine, since it points to um, Savok's main habitat as part of urban folklore. Um, it's not really a thing that should be, can or should be attached to one person. It immediately becomes part of the vocabulary and part of the kind of 
urban folk life um, of people, particularly in the late 80s and the, 19, and the 1990s. Um, and as I'm going to argue in the introduction to the memes book and possibly in a later lecture in the series, you can draw a straight line from Soviet era urban folklore to um, post-Soviet meme culture. There's a, they, they, they function, there's an evolution of an information ecosystem from one to the other. Now the word savuk um, is rather polyvalent. Um, literally savuk is a, dust, is a um, dustpan, um, but obviously the term comes from the, um, the word sovietsky, Soviet. And as a term of abuse or ironic affection for either the entire Soviet Union, the Soviet system or Soviet mentality, or a Soviet person. And that's, that's the category that I have in mind right now. Though nowadays, um, more often than not, if you hear the term Savuk, it's really about um, the USSR and the Soviet past as in um, saying, accusing people wanting to drag us back to the Savuk. And this is a, a caricature of let, let's, um, let's bring everything back, but in a phrasing that's kind of interesting. Um, in the 1990s, concerns about a, um, a backwards yokel type person was usually expressed in relation to the Soviet Union that had just collapsed. That is, um, the embarrassing uncultured or the embarrassing um, person who really did not know how to um, make his way around in the contemporary world was marked as someone who was a holdover from Soviet times. Um, and this is something uh, that is uh, featured in a, um, a, an important 1998 song, 1988 song by um, Igor Talkov. I just love this picture of Igor Talkov here. He's like some sort of, um, I don't know, um, imaginary BG. Um, and he had a song called Safki, um, which is about the Savok phenomenon. Weirdly enough, somewhere in the middle, actually it, it, um, it has its own melody, but it takes a very obvious riff from the Yes song, Owner of a Lonely Heart, for reasons that I can't quite um, fathom. But anyway, Savok starts to become an available concept. The Savok is a backwards person who's really bad at consumer culture, at, at, at mass culture, who's an embarrassment and who's um, noted for his bad taste. Um, there's different types of um, understanding of who the Savok is. Um, Viktor Kilievin sees the Savok as an intellectual who couldn't handle life in the new um, capitalist world of the cash nexus. But no matter what, he's basically a yokel. Really, um, the Savok, uh, strangely enough, even, th even though this is not a Russian, um, a Russian creation, the Savok is really kind of Borat's. Um, now the Savok starts to lose currency the further away we get from the USSR, um, when you can't simply blame every um, negative or perceived negative phenomenon on being a holdover from the Soviet past. And, there, and in, in Russia's Alienations, I talk about lots of alternatives for a usually class-based disdain for an entire category of supposedly backward people in Russia. Um, Budla is a very common um, term used. Budla um, basically it's, a, it's an outdated or Polish word for cattle. Um, this is from a video saying, called um, How to Identify Budla. Um, it's, a, it's a very derisive term for um, basically um, idiots who believe everything they're told on television and are ready to get into a fight at any, any particular moment. Um, but the Vatnik really becomes the heir to the Savok starting, um, starting around the 2012 election. And um, the Vatnik actually does have an author. Um, a man who calls himself Anton Chadsky. Chadsky is a pseudonym. It's a um, combination of the last name Chadayev, author of the Philosophical Letters, and Chadsky from Gribayedov's Woe for, Wo from Wit. He comes up with Chadsky. Um, and he created um, an internet, and he actually created a cartoon, because he is a cartoonist, that he would call, um, that he would call Vatnik. Um, and so the irony here is that the Savuk, um, which was pre-internet, is an authorless meme, is more like folklore, and um, in his authorlessness is more like in internet memes usually are. Vatnik, who as we're gonna see, is um, a creature of the internet. Once, once Chatsky draws him, he's all over the internet. Um, he has an identifiable author, which is Chatsky himself. Um, but as, as is the case when there is an identifiable author, as in the sad story of the, um, the Pepe the Frog meme, um, authorship doesn't mean you have any control over what happens to the image. So. Um, so what is a Vatnik literally? I mean, if a Savok is literally a, a dustpan, a Vatnik also means something literally. A Vatnik is a kind of coat, a wadded cotton coat. Um, here's another Vatnik. Um, to which you might reasonably say, so what? What is the big deal about a kind of coat? What's so good or so bad about a coat? And intrinsically nothing, but it's all about context. Um, the Vatnik was part of the um, Soviet army's winter uniform from the 1940s to the 1960s and was standard issue um, clothing for prisoners in the Gulag. Um, so it has military associations, it has prison camp associations. 
Um, and Chodsky explained in 2014 that back in 2011, a couple of months before the, pro the uh, protests over the Duma elections, he decided, he's, he writes, I decided to draw a character who would embody all the negative qualities of the typical Russian citizen. He would use the word Rossiyanin. Um, by analogy to SpongeBob SquarePants, Rashka Square Vatnik, that is Rashka Kvadratny Vatnik, was born. So this name itself is a little um, interesting. First of all, there's Rashka. So Rashka is another, is a, is another term that, uh, that plays a, an important role in the um, vocabulary of self-hatred and abuse. Um, Rashka, of course, comes from the word Russia, um, but not the Russian word Russia, but the English word Russia, because in Russian, of course, Russia is Rasiya or the old word Rus. So this is taking the English word Russia adding the um, diminutive ka, which is often a kind of um, way of depreciating something. Um, and rashka is a term of abuse. That is, um, online, there, well, rashka is a meme of its own. So here's a rashka meme. It says, rashka srane parashka, Rush, um, Russia, um, the shitty outhouse. Um, or here, um, unile rashka takai unile. Um, sad, pathetic rashka, so pathetic. Um, so rashka is an image of Russia that is just, uh, falling apart, miserable, covered in shit. No one would really want to live there. Um, and the thing about Rashka is it's a very controversial term because um, for people who use it, um, it represents an attitude towards about everything they don't like about their own country. But then people who are upset over Rashka see the use of the term Rashka as, as absolutely offensive um, and as a sign of rustophobia. Um, it has a... Um, it's a little more pointed, but has a similar, um, similar life cycle in Russian contemporary discourse to the, the phrase, literally in this country. This, says not, this is a sign that says, um, speed must be reasonable, and you have a car that's run into the sign, and it says, not in this country, guys, not in this country. Now in English, the phrase in this country is, to is neutral or even positive. The, you know, we can say in this country, and you mean something very, you can be a proud American, talk about what we do in this country. Um, in Russian, saying в этой стране, in this country, as opposed to в нашей стране, in our country, is marked as a kind of um, disdain for, for um, the country in which, in which you live. Um, now, so Rashka, so, so using Rashka here, which is part of this whole um, derogatory discourse, um, already um, makes the Vatnik very marked. Um, and then he takes the SpongeBob image and turns him into a square, instead of square pants, into a square Vatnik, fine. And so you have um, the Vatnik who looks basically like this. See, I know he's supposed to be a, a coat, but he always looks more to me like a glove. Um, and this isn't even the original image, but th this image, this particular image of the Vatnik um, is very commonly used with um, a words above or below it um, as a meme to say something. And here, what he's saying is, but, um, that is, you're all lying, but all is one word misspelled, which is made to sound like someone who's drunk um, is accusing everybody of lying. Um, so the visual inspiration for Vatnik is from SpongeBob. He's roughly the same shape, but the satirical inspiration is, is much um, harsher, more like um, Seth MacFarlane and, and Family Guy. SpongeBob is bright and yellow. Vatnik is gray. SpongeBob smiles vacantly and stupidly at us. Um, Vatnik looks like a mean drunk. One of his eyes, as you see, is always blackened. His teeth are usually uh, few and far between, and his face has a perpetual five o'clock shadow. So the Savok started out and remained a character, character type. Vatnik was a character, a specific character intended to suggest an entire type. Um, and one huge difference between um, Vatnik and Savok is that Savok, you can kind of smile tenderly at the Savok. You can feel affectionate, affection for the Savok. Um, the Vatnik, as um, established here, is um, angry and mean um, and very difficult to love for someone who does not share his values. Um, so when aggressive patriotic sentiment really starts to come to the forefront during the war in Ukraine, Vatnik was already there on the internet and available um, as an image and as an idea to, um, to uh, caricature um, uh, Russia, a certain type of Russian patriotism. Um, and this is where Vatnik's trajectory really differs from that of the Savok. Um, because whereas the Savok was a concept that could, um, was known primarily by people who could fall into that category, that is, you could ironically say, yeah, I guess I'm kind of a Savok too. Um, Vatnik takes a different path. Vatnik is some, initially something you would not call yourself. Vatnik is now both a specific character as seen in this image and a general category. 
And also in Ukraine, Vatnik starts to become a designation for the Russian enemy, and in a sense becomes an ethnonym, an ethnic term, um, rather than simply um, a term for a type of person. And also spawns, by the way, a Ukrainian counterpart, the Vushevatnik, that is um, uh, uh, like the Vatnik, but wearing the Ukrainian peasant shirt and like hyper Ukrainian and um, re reflexively Ukrainian in, um, in, its, in its patriotism. Within Russia and within the Russian speaking community, Vatnik is not so much an ethnic slur as it is a political label. So, um, so Putin's critics would reserve the label Vatnik and its more generalized um, corollary, Vata, literally cotton, is, um, for, um, for the type of people um, who, um, for the type of people um, who are in the, who are on your own society in, um, in Russia, but the type of people you find particularly loathsome. Internally, Vatnik was essentially a politicized pro-Putin budla. Um, Gradsky describes Vatnik as the grandson of the son of the Savok, thinking in the same categories, but under contemporary Russian conditions and realities. Um, he says that the um, image of the Savok is more parodic and more caricatured negative. Um, the Vatnik is a person living according to stereotypes delivered to him by the state on television screens. So the Vatnik is both an aggressive drunk and uh, a um, TV addict who believes everything that is being um, told, him, told him on television. Um, he also says about the Vatnik that the Vatnik is the Russian citizen who to this day still mentally lives in Stalin's camps and is fine with that. And here's another Vatnik meme where um, Vatnik says, if it weren't for Stalin, we all would be dead. Um, for him, Vatnik is first and foremost about hatred. And so a lot of the Vatnik memes, and these are not ones made by Chatsky himself, but it seems like Chatsky set up a pattern that people are quite willing to run with, um, have a very angry, hateful Vatnik or, or multiple hate, hateful Vatniki. Um, here are three different Vatniki in a miserable rundown village. I think one of them is just thrown up. Um, and it says, um, with misspellings, um, uh, the West wants to uh, bring down my, my darling Russia. And everything here is, is misspelled. Um, or another one with um, a, fu an, a furious Vatnik who also seems to be something of a rooster, I suppose, um, shouting a whole range of, um, of slogans um, that um, contradict themselves. Here, here is um, Rashka um, saying, America never gave anything to the world. Um, notice how much of the, um, the memes about, um, about Vatnik are about how awful Vatnik thinks America is because the point of the point of the critique embedded within Vatnik is that the um, the uh, patriotism of the of um, Putin's third term this kind of ura patriotism this reflexive um, um, patriotism um, is built largely on animosity towards um, an enemy that is very useful for the regime in this case America um, or here uh, um, Vatnik is saying. Um, I broke a window in a, um, in a German bar. That was my revenge for my grandpa, go, go us. Um, this leads back to the um, slogans I was talking about when we were talking about Obama Schmore, um, the uh, World War II uh, celebration slogans about how my grandfather fought in the war and therefore um, I am somehow heroic as well. Um, and here's a Vatnik basically um, spouting a whole bunch of patriotic slogans, hooray for um, for, for our grandfathers, for Rus, for Stalin, for Russian Orthodoxy, victory. To put it simply, um, on the one hand, Vatnik is very, very Russian in, in the terms of um, how he is drawn, the things that he's concerned with. But, on this, but if you step back a bit, um, the type that is being created here um, or, um, with the Vatnik um, is strangely international. That is, it'd be very easy to make an American Vatnik character you basically would make him out of a MAGA hat, um, shouting MAGA slogans. And it would fit, and it would work almost as well, I think, as the Vatnik. Um, so as Vatnik um, spreads on the internet and um, gets more and more attention, um, then things get a bit more complicated. Because even if we accept that um, hatred is initially the product of, of Vatnik and the people he parodies, the hatred eventually becomes a two-way street. Um, it's, Love, so loving Vatnik as a parody is difficult to disentangle from 
hating Vatnik as object of the parody. That is, loving this parody looks a lot like really hating the people that the parody is supposed to represent, which is something I think we can all be familiar with, those of us in America, with um, discourse around, again, Naga and, and, and Trump. Um, so the question arises, and the question is brought up again and again, is Vatnik an instrument of Russophobia? The image of Vatnik is so hostile, even if it is hilarious, that accusations of Russophobia start to look somewhat credible. Um, now, Chatsky rejects the possibility that Vatnik could be reappropriated in a positive manner, as we've seen happen so often on the internet, right? That, that a, um, an image can be turned 180 degrees to mean something the opposite of its original intent. He doesn't seem to believe in the possibility of an over-identification with Vatnik, that is Vatnik as Stjop, the kind of humor that you get with Stephen Colbert, where you just um, identify so much with it that you, you reduce everything that's being said um, by this caricature into a kind of absurdity. Um, however, um, there are ways in which, despite the miserableness of the Vatnik um, image here and the Vatnik meme, that the notion of Vatnik does get co-opted um, and does end up playing um, strangely positive roles in, in um, the worlds of some people who are consuming the, uh, the Vatnik meme. Um, in a 2006 article, 2016 article on uh, conspicuous patriotic consumption, um, Viera uh, Skvirska traces the path of the Vatnik from liberal satire to nationalist point of pride. Um, but what it turns out she's talking about, she mentions the meme, but what she's largely talking about is, um, is national pride as symbolized in the adoption of the Vatnik as coat. That is, um, instead of being ashamed of this particular coat as being old fashioned or, or connected to the military or connected to the gulag, um, that now the Vatnik for some people can become um, a point of pride and item um, connected to style. So Vatnik even makes its way onto the runway. I checked these images so many times to make sure I was not being fooled by some parody sites. Um, but from all I can tell, it is real. Um, Vatnik, the, the Vatnik coat has um, been revived for a kind of, if not au couture, some kind of couture, some kind of fashion. Um, and so her examples are not about people um, are not about people taking that image of the Vatnik and saying, yeah, that's me, but they're about people proudly wearing the Vatnik and saying everything that I associate with this coat, a whole range of positive things, including a victory in World War II and um, connection to my grandparents and so on and so forth, while you are seeing it primarily as negative. And eventually you even have people who will call themselves Vatniki, quite proudly call themselves Vatniki. But when they do that, they're not saying that they're looking at this particular, um, they're looking like this particular image. And a quick search of the internet reveals um, multiple instances of Russian speakers proudly proclaiming their Vatnik identity, um, even if um, these instances are dwarfed by um, the amount of content that ridicules the Vatnik. And in 2015, a self-published poet and science fiction writer named, named Andrei Lukin um, composed a poem called Ya Vatnik. I am a Vatnik, which was subsequently set to music, of course, um, by uh, um, Vasily Rodin and uh, made into a YouTube slideshow by the Tula Creative Association of Orthodox Writers. But its greatest success online with uh, 13,000 videos as, as of March 19, 2020, is a video of the poem as read by the actor Yuri Nazarov. Um, Yuri Nazarov is a mainstay of um, Soviet and Russian cinema, and he's best known and this is, I think, quite appropriate for this particular, um, this particular topic, as um, the heroine's father in Malinka y Vera, Little Vera, the um, Piristroika era film that shows um, how miserable uh, life in a late Soviet um, uh, provincial city is. So um, I'm going to just play a little bit of this um, video for you, and Sasha is going to put the translation of the first verse uh, in the chat for those of you who would like to have the English. And let's hope this works. There we go. Андрей Лукин, земляк мой, с которым просто называется «Я в ватне». Два эпиграфа, один из Юрия Левитанского «Я пламя вечного огня и пламя гильзы в блиндаже» и «Юнноморец, ватник я и колорад». Я ватник, я потомственный совок, я в СССР рожден во время ООН, я черный хлеб, я кирзовый сапог, я... Воинской присяги звонкий слог И красные победные знамена. Я не был на войне, но Ту войну я каждым нервом помню И кляну. 
Я ватник. Я советский. Я москаль. Я сын иного времени и века. Во мне горит, как закалялась сталь. И в майский день солдатская медаль. И солнце пионерского артека. Я коммунистом заново не стал, но отступать. И каяться устал. So it goes on. Um, but what is interesting here is it's very passionate, um, but it's a reaction that is, while appropriating the terms Vatnik, Kalarad, um, Savok, and so on and so forth, um, is still doing it in a register that, as he said, he himself says, I am Soviet. Um, it is completely uninterested or incapable of um, matching the irony um, that is um, present in all of the previous Vatnik stuff that I've shown you um and i th i think to this kind of irony is actually foreign and is, and is actually a problem um so the response that takes on um Vatnik as a point of pride is not over identification it's not still because it's um it's taken on by people for whom that kind of over identification that kind of next level irony would be almost impossible because they're they're opposing irony with an intense very old-fashioned um sincerity that can be appealing if the values that, that are being expressed here have any resonance with you. Um, but if they don't, um, then they are in a sense making the, the anti-Vatnik case for, um, for you. Now, this is almost 14,000 views on YouTube. Um, it's nothing like the popularity of the satirical YouTube um, videos about the Vatnik. Um, for instance, there is a song called Ya Vatnik, I'm a Vatnik, by someone who um, posts under the unfortunate name Bitard671. Um, and his song, which is very venomous about, about the Vatnik, had um, almost 100,000 views um, to the 13,000 of this one. I wanted to play it, but in, the, in between the time, in between March when I first wrote about the song and now, um, interestingly, the song I'm a Vatnik was um, removed from, um, from YouTube for violating YouTube's policy on hate speech. Um, which is really rather funny because half the stuff I, I come across would also violate the content of hate speech, but this must have been reported. So I, I cannot find the video for you. I'm sure it'll surface, it'll surface again. And if I, if I had more time, I could have looked for it for you. Um, so still this kind of um, uh, over, ironic over-identification might surround Vatnik as the item of clothing, but the path for converting the Vatnik stereotype into something positive relies on turning vices into virtues on turning a portrait of, a, of um, regressive nostalgia into a, por a portrait of, into a point of pride and on rejecting irony completely. So what's all this, what's all this come to then? To sum up, Vatnik starts out as an item of clothing. It's sturdy, practical, not glamorous, um, then in some circles scorned, and then it becomes a fashion accessory. That's uh, um, in, in, in brief, the life cycle of Vatnik, the item of clothing. Meanwhile, Chatsky turns into a cartoon character. The cartoon character becomes a meme. And the image in the meme itself is pretty irredeemable. It's hard to identify with positively. It's so over the top in its caricature of Russian nationalists that it brings accusations of lucophobia. Um, and in fact, the, uh, the man, uh, Chatsky himself, had to flee Russia to Ukraine. Um, the meme itself becomes a slur. The slur remains a slur, but is sometimes reappropriated. Um, by um, self-proclaimed patriots, which makes sense because the item of, of clothing itself is not in itself bad. Um, so you end up with Vatnik the coat, which can be both negative and positive. Vatnik the cartoon, who's um, negative and irredeemable, but you can enjoy him if you share the values of, of the irony, of, of the ironist who produced it. Vatnik the meme, basically the same. And Vatnik the slur, which, start, which is essentially negative, but becomes redeemable through this process of... Um, reappropriation by people who, um, who identify with the values that are being um, attacked here. Um, and again, we see that internet memes are not just internet memes. If we buy the viral metaphor, which I have real problems with, and I'll get to that at some point, um, internet memes may have their original home reservoir like a virus does, but they're capable of making multiple species jumps or spillovers. So we call a virus and, um, that moves from animal to, hu to human zoonotic, which you may have heard recently um, if, you, if you are obsessively reading about viruses the way I am in the past couple of months. The process is zoonosis, moving from animals to humans. And so I asked myself, what do we call a virus that moves um, from, general culture, from the general culture to the internet or from the internet back into the world? Is it netonosis, diginosis? Um, 
I think these are terrible terms and neither of them are bound to find mimetic success because they're so ugly. But the concept behind them, the idea behind them um, of this species jump from the internet to the um, broader world is something that I'm hoping um, to explore and hoping maybe all of you can help me with. That's all I wanted to say for today. All right, great. So we have a few questions. Um, the first question from Allison. Um, I'm fascinated by that runway image. <laughs> Elliot, do you know who the designer was and what season and year those came down the runway? I can find it. I can find the original article and send it to you. Um, but really, the um, the uh, Swedish guy and um, article I mentioned, which I believe was on digital icons, and again I can send that to you as well, um, goes into much more detail into the fashion side of things than than I would care to. Um, but is is really really useful for that. Um, but it's around 2015. All right. Um, Bitard is a 4chan signifier. This question is from yes. Sadie. Um, how popular is 4chan in Russia? So 4chan is, is popular and then various other um, Russian language offshoots of it are quite popular. Um, but I think, I, I think the Bitard thing is less a matter of it coming directly from 4chan than a 4chan aesthetic um, that has really, um, has really um, moved into certain parts of the internet. For instance, one of my, um, one of my important sources for material here is, is uh, Lurkmore. Um, the ironic uh, kind of uh, the ironic nasty Wikipedia um, that has lots of memes and um, lots of fun stuff on it, and it's um, it's often written in a kind of Obonsky that is the kind of bad spelling and all of that, and um, is rather unserious. But I was actually looking up, I think, I was looking at Viking on it just earlier today, and um, noticing that oh, it was trying, it was it was mentioning. Pre, well, we'd, I'd say precursors to the idea, I think it was a Vatnik, um, but the section of it was called in Russian, old fagi, um, which sounds like old fogies, but it really it's, pardon me, old fags, because on 4chan, everyone's a fag of some sort or another. Um, and so um, I don't think you have to go on 4chan to get that, that kind of nomenclature um, as part of your internet culture. Okay, so we have a question from Nancy. Uh, his, botanic, his botanic poem is very Yevtushenko, not only the rhythm, but also the characteristic inversion of meaning, negative, is, uh, negative to positive, uh, pronounced by an educated diction that belies it. So comment then. Yeah, I completely agree. It's very Yevtushenko, which must ex help explain why I hate it so much. Um, so yeah, absolutely. Um, and that's not a surprise, right? Because of this kind of dilettantist um, graphomaniac poetry is going to likely be imitating some familiar style. Um, and Yevtushenko is certainly available. I don't have any more questions in the chat. Uh, if anybody has anything, please submit or raise your hands. Um. <clears throat> Uh, Elliot, can I make a suggestion to think about for the future? Please. Can I put in my vote for what I'd love to hear you talk about? Okay, great. Uh, it's a, yeah, I apologize because it's a bit of a different topic, but all the same, I would love to engage with you and listen to you on the subject of Little Big. It was supposed to, of course, uh, put in a, a Eurovision song this coming uh -huh. summer. Right. And I, it drove me back to look at, at the Little Big songs, and they, in their oh. own way, they really are fascinating. Yeah. Do you think, how relevant do you think they are to, uh, to what I'm talking about? Um, I think definitely that they frame themselves as memes of the future and have yeah. been frames uh, and have been framed by other critics as uh, hmm. upending the meme, the contemporary memes. And in that, that is, sense, I think it's potentially relevant. That is great. Okay. I will consider that and I will start listening to them more a little big, which I will either thank you for or curse you for. Well, I'll let you know. <laughs> yeah, do both, please. <laughs> Okay, we have a question from uh, Catherine. Uh, I first came across Vatnik in the Ukrainian context, where, as you said, it's used to talk about Russians in Ukraine or Russian-speaking Ukrainians who support Russian influence in the region. Have you seen this happening with other memes? Memes made by Russians to criticize other Russians that have become appropriated in places like Ukraine or the Baltics to disparage mm -hmm. their Russian-speaking populations? That is an excellent question. 
Um, nothing so specific comes to mind, though I believe I've seen ra the, the word ra used to write um, in um, meme, memes and meme-related uh, stuff, um, for, at least from Ukraine. Um, so there's that. But um, so Vatnik's the only obvious answer that comes to mind for me. But I think, in a sense, what, what, what you bring up, um, even though I'm not answering your question directly, is a reminder of something that's really important about, the, um, about Russia online, which is, ironically, in a sense, um, Putin's, uh, Putin's uh, notion of, a, well, it's not originally his, but of the Ruski Mir, the Russian world, um, is very much an internet phenomenon, right? That is one thing that unites people in Russia and Ukraine and Belarus and in the Baltics, uh, at least for now, is an understanding of the Russian language. So um, ironically, for some of this, um, for some of this anti-Russian rhetoric to appear, to appear on the radar of people who don't speak, say, Ukrainian, Belarusian, or um, any of the Baltic languages, it has to be expressed in Russian. Um, so um, this is very post-colonial, obviously, and so that's very familiar. Um, but Russia, Russian as still something of a lingua franca means that um, the Russian internet is more, is available um, in these countries outside of Russia, even in countries that whose policies and whose people and, and, and um, the people who are specifically posting um, might be very um, anti-Russian in, in their political attitudes. And we have a question from David. David, I can unmute you. I'll unmute. Still there muted. We go. Now I'm unmuted. Uh, <laughs> Thanks. That was that was very interesting. I'd, I'd like to pick up on something you just dropped but didn't expand on, but hear you say more about uh, the idea of irony is foreign, because, of course, nothing is more Russian than irony. Yeah. Uh, but <laughs> at the same time, there's a sense in which, like, among anti-intellectual patriot types of every country, irony is foreign. That, you know, that probably in America we see it as a feat in Europe, or those who see it as such, see it as a feat in European or, or something like mm -hmm. that. Um, and, and, you know, I'm sure in all, in every country there's, you know, there's, there's such a view. Could, could you go into that more? Sure. Well, I was using the term foreign as alien rather than um, other cult, uh, country, but still, no, I, I, I take your point. Yeah, Russia, you know, Russia as a, uh, writ large is no stranger to irony, obviously. Um, and also people who support a, um, how should we put it, a, an, a regime that is expressly either ideological or expressly patriotical, or patriotic or expressly something, um, tend to be lower on the irony scale. Um, and a few years ago, David, I would have agreed with you completely, um, but now I think in the United States, at the very least, and I think in other countries, but I can only speak to the United States, um, we've seen this frightening uh, mastery of irony on the part of the extreme right. Um, and so what has long, so many things that were long the weapons of, um, the discursive weapons of the left and of the progressives have been appropriated by the right wing and left to us, I'm going to speak you know, for an us, flat-footed um, because we, you know, it's, we're very used to the narrative of, of we are ironists fighting people who don't understand irony. That's a fun narrative. It's worked for a long, long time. It puts us in a very good position. Um, but when the irony is about your progressive views, when um, a Trump advisor on um, CNN, when confronted with the idea of babies, of children be kept in cages, that makes the sad trombone womp womp noise, um, we're kind of this, we are then put in this position of being really sincere and earnest, um, which then puts us, makes us kind of flat-footed. So I'm not sure the extent to which, um, which that kind of alt-right, I haven't seen as much of that kind of alt-right irony, I've seen alt-right politics, but alt-right irony in the Russian discursive world, um, but it's, it's very frightening and, and um, very destabilizing to me. Um, but it's also, even, even in America, it's still kind of next level um, right wingness, right? I mean, I think um, there's a vast n number of people who are um, on the right who would not be capable or interested in that kind of trolling, um, but might admire it. And we have a question from Jane. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, you mentioned that there could have been an American style inversion concerning Trump supporters. Yeah. Do you think there is no such phenomenon? And if not, or if such is minimal, what does this tell us about what makes such class-based insulting possible in Russian discourse? That's interesting. Um, so, I mean, I think with MAGA and Trump, there's just so, there, there's such an outpouring of um, parody and hostility and of editorial cartooning and satire that um, it, I mean, I think what, part of the thing is that we don't need to come up with a character like that because we have Trump himself. I mean, Trump himself looks so much like a caricature um, that um, the work is done, right? Um, so, I mean, the, the, the characters in editorial, editorial cartoons of Trump, they just look like Trump, right? I'm um, just a little more orange or something. So, um, there's, so I'm not sure if that's the only reason, um, but I don't think there, there is a demand. Um, otherwise, hmm. yeah, I don't think, I, it, you know, nothing, we don't, we don't have, or maybe we don't even need a left-wing Pepe the Frog um, for this because, because we just have Trump. Um, but what we do also have is more niche things that um, don't necessarily have a fixed image. Like, uh, for instance, um, many of you are probably familiar with Karen, right? Like someone being a Karen. Um, this starts out particularly in the African-American community about a certain type of white woman who is just so ready to call the police anytime someone black does anything or is so basic or um, um, so limited in her, in her outlook. Um, and so there's lots of Karen memes. And, and I feel sorry for anyone named Karen who's not like this, right? Because you're just kind of stuck. But there's lots of Karen related discourse out there. But I don't think there's a specific like cartoonish image of Karen that is just the Karen. Um, so uh, for whatever reason, um, I don't think it's, it's quite congealed that way. And we have a question from Olga. Uh, can you comment on the female version of Vodnik, Vodnitsa? Does she have the same characteristics and function as the male version? Is it, uh, it is interesting that Maria Zaharova used it ironically on her Facebook page back in 2016, but it seems that it was in a different context. This is the quote in English. Today I'm, today I'm a real Vajnitsa in a Vajnik with cotton candy straight from Polovyov. <laughs> so I just have not encountered that much Vajnitsa stuff. Um, and maybe I haven't been looking hard enough um, but um, I just have not seen Vatnitsa playing such a, such a big role. Um, and I'm going to look for this, given that you've said this. Um, but I guess I can't answer the question adequately because I just haven't seen enough. Uh, and I sent a link to the thank post you. that was referenced in the, in the chat. Okay. So thank you, Olga. Um, from Tanya. Uh, thank you, Elliot. I was wondering about the memes about emigration. The word Rashka very often is part of a phrase, uh, Valit is Rashka. Um, yeah. Uh, and there is a famous meme about Parasyonik Pyotr yes. who escapes Russia. Would you say Valit is uh, Rashki memes are mostly patriotic or mostly ironic? Well, I would not call them patriotic. Um, <laughs> uh, not in the sense it's often used, used in Russia. Um, definitely ironic, and I was actually thinking of uh, of the Parasionik as a, as his own topic at some point. Um, so Valiti Zarashki, absolutely, absolutely, um, and that might even be one of the earliest, most common um, uses of of the term. But the word has spread enough that you can talk about Rashka without talking about how how, how you have to Valiti Zarashki. Um, but yes, I think I think it's connected to immigration. Oh, and I didn't even mention the biggest irony about Rashka that I really meant to, which just cracks me. I keep coming up against again and again in popular fiction, where you'll hear people complaining about those Americans and all that who call our country Rashka, which is just great because no American that doesn't speak Russian will call Russia Rashka because they would never have heard the term. You have to be Rush. You have to speak Russian to come up with Rashka. It has to be internal. But then there's an assumption that those horrible people out there are calling us that when we wouldn't. We don't know enough to call to call Russia Rashka. And I, 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 every time I come across that, I'm just very, very, very amused. Um, okay, and a question from Brunilda. There was a lot of Stalin in those caricatures. Stalin used to be he who will not be ironized. How do you see this use of Stalin fitting into Stalin's reshaping in the Putin era? Well, I think it's about Stalin's re reshaping in the Putin era. And um, so the, Im the image I showed you and the images I've seen don't actually do, do so much to Stalin. Stalin is there as a signifier. 
Um, it's not, it, there's no need in these memes to make fun of Stalin. What you're doing is making fun of the person who is putting Stalin on a pedestal. Um, and in fact, putting Stalin in the same row with Russian Orthodoxy and the church and so on and so forth. Um, so Stalin isn't the target. Stalin is, um, Stalin is a, not even a weapon, Stalin's an attribute, um, like the code itself. Um, that is, it's the way we make a whole bunch of assumptions based on how people present themselves, right? So, so the assumption here is that someone who you could identify as looking like whatever you think a Vatnik would look like, they'd probably like, they'd probably be pro-Stalin, right? We make these sort of assumptions in our, in our various worlds all the time based on how someone carries themselves. Oh, they're, that, um, or, or their musical tastes or the tastes in entertainment um, about the politics that go along with it. Um, and since Vatnik is a creation rather than simply something identified as in, in something empir empirical and factual, then in a sense, by definition, um, what is identified as a Vatnik is someone who probably has um, warm feelings about Stalin. And would be very upset about things like, um, you know, the death of Stalin movie and, and things like that. Um, because Stalin, of course, you know, led us to victory. And that seems to be it, unless anybody has any last minute questions, raise your hands, um, submit to the chat. No? Okay. Oh, we actually, okay, we have one question. Okay. Uh, from Eugene. Thanks, Elliot. Is there any significance to the square pants origin of Vodnik? Um, just that it's, that it's based on SpongeBob square pants. So for whatever, what I can't explain to you is why SpongeBob has square pants. Um, I've watched way too much SpongeBob, but I've never seen the origin of his pants. Um, and, uh, and it's just coming from that. Okay. So, oh, by the way, next week, I've already said, next week I'm going to talk about the Zhdun meme, um, this big homunculus that sits around and waits patiently. So we can all wait patiently for, for Zhdun. Well, on that note, uh, thank you so much, Elliot, uh, for once again uh, brightening up our Friday afternoon. I uh, hope mm -hmm. everyone has a wonderful weekend and stays safe. And hope to see as many of you as possible uh, next week for Elliot's next talk. We can wait till then. But if, you, if while we were waiting until then, you want to check out Denise Ducal's talk on Wednesday. Uh, Sasha put the information in the chat. You can find it, as always, on the Jordan Center website. And uh, thanks, everybody, for, for being here. Thanks again. Take care. Thank you.